if you're lost in the woods, you're more likely to find your way out if you believe there's a way out. If you don't believe there's a way out, you give up easily. You run into this obstacle, you run into a rock, you run into a tree, you run into a stream. And they seem impassable, and you give up. But if you believe there's a way out, then you feel, well, there must be a way around the rock, around the tree, over the stream. You put more energy into finding a way, more ingenuity, more persistence. Because if you haven't found the way out yet, it's simply a matter of not having found the right path or not having followed it long enough. And because of that belief, you're more determined in your pursuit, and you're much more likely to find your way out. This is why when the Buddha listed the five strengths, with the fifth being discernment, the discernment that leads to the end of suffering, the first item in the list is conviction. Conviction that your actions do matter, and ultimately, of course, that conviction that there is a way out. And having this conviction helps you get around problems in your meditation. If the mind has trouble settling down and you believe that it can't really settle down, it's never going to settle down because you won't put the effort into it. You won't use the ingenuity you need to get it to settle down. And you won't apply the persistence. So this is why it's important that you develop this sense of conviction. There is a way out. The mind can be trained. The energy you put into the meditation is not wasted. Because that conviction leads to the second strength, which is persistence. We're fortunate we're in a much better position than the Buddha was. He didn't have a guide to his path. He had to basically slash his way through the forest. We, however, are following a path that's already been set out. Of course, as we sit here and meditate, the path doesn't, may not appear all that clear. As the mind wanders off to the left, wanders off to the right, stops and looks at the flowers and the birds. But we know this, we have this path. You stick with the meditation, stick with your meditation object as consistently as you can. And you find that the mind will change. It will gradually grow more and more tame. Just as with some processes in nature, it's a matter of time. Say you have a wound on your hand, and you apply a cream to heal the wound. That's not the case that you simply apply it once and then rub it right off. You apply the cream, and the cream has to stay there for a long time for it to do its healing work. And some of the disturbances or illnesses in the mind are the sorts that require that you simply stick with your meditation object over and over and over again, keep coming back, coming back. Of course, persistence here doesn't mean simply brute effort or brute strength. It means right effort, the appropriate effort. checking to see what works and what doesn't work. This is how the remaining strengths come in. You have the mindfulness and the alertness to not only keep your meditation in mind, but also to keep in mind what you did and then notice the results that come from what you did. So if the results aren't what you want, you can try changing what you've done. 
In other words, sometimes when you bring the mind very forcefully to its object, it rebels. Well, is there a way you can lure it in, to tempt it to stay with the object, make the object more interesting, more attractive, develop a greater sense of interest in what, for instance, the breath is doing for your body? It's a simple process, breathing in, breathing out, but it can have a huge impact on the health of the body, the functioning of the different organs, your posture, the flow of the blood through the different parts of the body, which parts are not getting enough blood, which are getting too much stagnant blood. Try to make a survey of how things feel in the body. Sensitize yourself to this. And this becomes a strength in the practice. And as you stick with it long enough, with a sense of conviction, mindfulness, and alertness, concentration does develop. Now, concentration is going to develop in many ways. We read in the text, it seems like a very simple ladder. You go through this stage and then to the next stage, you can hit the first jhana, and then you let go of directed thought and evaluation, you go to the second jhana. And it sounds like one single stairway through the mind. But the mind is more like a jungle, or you can compare it to the chaparral up there. All those coyote paths, some of the coyote paths go nowhere, some of the coyotes' paths only coyotes can follow, and some of them you can follow. And you find yourself sometimes wandering around in the chaparral trying to find a path that you can follow to get out. Well, the mind is even more complex than the chaparral. It's got lots of little paths. And many times you have lots of paths at work. At least they work for different purposes. When I was practicing with the John Fuang, there would be times when the mind would get into a state of wrong concentration. wrong in the sense that it wasn't right on the path, but as he pointed out, some, some of these wrong states do have their uses, so you don't just throw them away. They can provide a resting place for the mind when things get difficult, or they may not provide that sort of broad, full-body awareness that you'd like. But there are times when you need to simply nail the mind down to one spot in the midst of a lot of pain or in the midst of a lot of confusion in your life. And it's good to know that you can do that. So as you focus on the breath, don't expect that it will always settle down in the same way. Sometimes you find yourself suddenly focused on the, the earth element in the body. It's all very solid. And it can depending on you know, how you feel about it. It can be either very pleasant or very unpleasant. It's unpleasant when you want it to be something else. It can be pleasant when you want it to be that way. So if you find it unpleasant, ask yourself, well, what, what is this good for? This steely state, this heavy state, this solid state. It has its uses. to learn to recognize it, and then try to gain a sense of how you got in there and, and also how you can get out when it starts getting unpleasant or too much. This is how concentration practice fosters discernment, as you begin to notice the ways of the mind, how it focuses on things, how its attitude can change an experience from pleasant to painful, from painful back to pleasant, all depending on your perception, all depending on the feeling all those elements of fabrication or the elements of name and name and form. What you see is important, what you see is unimportant. This can really change how you experience something, how you experience a state of mind. This is the way you begin to see the principles of cause and effect in the mind. It's not a case that you get the mind really concentrated, then start thinking about discernment. You have to use your discernment in 
developing the concentration of the mind. This is how discernment gets developed. Once it's developed, okay, then you can use it to, to lift things, to move things around, to pierce through obstacles. And this is how conviction leads to release. The conviction that you can master the ways of the mind. You can use these basic skills of mindfulness, concentration, discernment. And the lessons you learn from them, the lessons you learn about perception, the lessons you learn about feeling, fabrication, all the aggregates, all the components of your mind. It's through learning these lessons that you can find your way out. This is one of the Buddhist great insights, is that these aggregates that we carry around can be fashioned into a path that leads to the end of having to carry anything around at all. So sometimes it may seem like you're simply mucking around in your old mind states, and it can be discouraging. Well, you're learning about them. Take this as an opportunity to say, well, at least I'm observing these things. Not simply to accept them, but well, to accept the fact that they exist, but also to accept the fact that you can approach them from a different way. Instead of making a burden out of them, you can make a path out of them. That's something you have to accept as well. That you can change. You hear about radical acceptance. Well, the Buddhist type of radical acceptance means accepting that you can take these elements of suffering and you can reconfigure them. They turn into a path. This is how the Buddha did it. And if you have conviction in his awakening, you realize, okay, I can do this too. So never let anybody tell you that there's no way out, that you simply have to accept things as they are, that this, what we have right here, this is already nirvana. It's not nirvana, but it can be reconfigured into a path that leads there. And that's a much more hopeful message. It's a message that helps provide you with a conviction so that you find the way out.